Hi, everybody. We're streaming live from Toronto, Ontario, which is grounded in the Treaty of the Dish with One Spoon and is home to some of the most diverse population in Toronto. I'm from the homeland and the heartland of the Métis Nation and Treaty One territory where the two great rivers meet and uh, the heart of Turtle Island. Um, I'm really excited for our second New Eve Launch Talk series. It's the New World Order of Gathering and Performing. We've got this incredible lineup of speakers such as Randell Aji, who is the Executive Director of Rise Entertainment and an incredible motivational speaker. We have Jen Goodwin, who's a Programming Supervisor at City Cultural Events uh, for the City of Toronto and also a performance artist herself. We have Dr. Heather Agluliorte, who's a Professor and Research Chair um, in Circumpolar and Indigenous Arts at Concordia University in Montreal and also a fellow GLAM member. Uh, we have some of my personal faves who might not need very much introduction at all. July talk with Leah and uh, Peter, who are the dynamic duo who find themselves home in Toronto. And we have the late night CBC host, Odario Williams, who's a musician and DJ. I have to kind of admit, I'm kind of liking this lineup. It's like I created this virtual concert. And uh, so I'm super happy to have all you guys here and um, excited to kind of get this conversation rolling. This talk will continue with the dialogue around the collapse of the old world order to critically map and map the emergence of new and radical alternatives. Speakers will consider acts of gathering and performing and the ways in which public art can reproduce relationships between artists and their communities, artworks and their audiences, and new actions and ways of performing. Each speaker can reflect on the important work they're doing on their own projects and the cultural shifts they see happening within their cities where they work, such as curating, building new decolonial spaces, performing, and advocating for change to be more inclusive and relevant in our current society. Nui Blanche is the largest public exhibition in North America, and it has totally shifted to a virtual event. We are excited to break new ground with our augmented and virtual um, reality works. But at the same time, we're a little bit sad to give up or think about the loss of not being in public space where we can radically transform uh, buildings and cityscapes in a way that you know art can do that. Um, we are also all witness to the struggle that the performing arts is facing as we continue to social distance. Live theater and concerts, which are some of my most favorite things to do, are almost halted. Each of you are working on incredible projects. It'd be great to hear about all of your work and it couldn't be more perfectly timed with tonight. It's light up the night for the Canada live events industry. So you'll see cities all across Canada with their red lighting up, trying to advocate for live events. I wanna open it up to our speakers and we're hoping that you can shed some light on what are the strategies moving forward. I was hoping we'd kick it off with Randall from RISE to see how their work has shifted and adapted to the current climate. Randall, all you. Hey everybody, my name is Randall Ajay. I am the founder and executive director of RISE of Utainment um, and also a, an artist booking agent. Uh, so for us, our work has really shifted to doing um, definitely obviously a lot more online work. Um, and I think a lot of the pivoting that we've done has really been about reaching out to the community throughout the, the pandemic and asking them what their needs are um, and what, what they really need. I think at the end of the day, when you serve and work with a, a, a demographic of people, it's so important that you not only understand what their needs are, but that you're willing to listen, uh, even if you can't necessarily create it right now. So what we've done, <clears throat> We found ways to, uh, you know, have artists in a space uh, where they come in at a specific time. Um, we book a space for an allocated time. An artist comes in for a specific time. They perform and they are being recorded live on Instagram, but we're also documenting it with a high def camera uh, so that we can create more content out of it um, for uh, more content to show, showcase in the future. Um, we've also been working to go out to the community and, you know, support from a, from a place of, I guess, the art of giving, <laughs> from a place of supporting individuals who are in need of, whether it be, you know, hygiene products and things of that sort. 
Um, but I think one of my favorite things that we've been able to do is just really, uh, there's a, a, an organization called C Alive, CYA Live, and it's just a, a better Zoom, better Skype. It's a really great platform to showcase the work that, uh, um, it, and it's, it's, it's in real time. So we've done a lot of performances with them. Um, but I mean, you know, it's, we're kind of limited in what we can do, but a lot of it has been virtual um, performances that we've curated and then we welcome other people in from, uh, you know, whether it's Instagram or Sia or Zoom for them to tune into what we're doing. Um, and we've also done a series of workshops just really questioning what's, uh, you know, what's taking place and what, where, where the artists really want to go. Um, and I guess the, the last thing I can share is, you know, in the music industry, a lot of the opportunities are really around touring. And so we've been really exploring what does it look like to create something virtual uh, that people can tune into, uh, you know, from a, like really a VR experience is kind of what we're working on right now. So people can have that experience of feeling like they're at a concert, even though they're not quite there. Yeah, I think that's the hard part I know of keep trying because it's like something that I totally love and enjoy is live music. And so I think that that's one of the hardest shifts, you know, and we've been watching a little bit and made me actually have to activate Facebook. For those of you that know me, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> Heather Laus because she makes me do it. And so we've been able to watch a few bits and pieces, but there's something amazing about the energy and being around people and feeding off that energy. And maybe uh, Leah and Peter, you guys want to talk a little bit about your own shift on your new um, CD release and kind of how you had to adapt to our new environment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think it ever occurred to us to sort of postpone anything or, or change our plans timing wise on our record release itself. And, and so kind of just had to forge ahead and, and we, had planned a big show specifically in Toronto and a bunch of touring. Um, but the, you know, it was like a day before we re we announced it when everything got canceled. And, you know, I remember the NBA was the big sort of like, oh, okay, so this is real, this is gonna stick. And, and so we shifted and someone at our management company had an idea of doing a drive-in show. And so that was kind of our opportunity to learn about you know, where the protocol was at and what we were going to be able to do. Um, and found a drive-in theater north of Toronto with three drive-in screens and could take about 500 cars and and uh, started designing the show. And it was really special, you know. It was, I think, fun for the most part because of the community of crew and artists that we've worked with for years that were all out of work. So like everybody that would be on tour with all of these great artists like Daniel Caesar and and Feist and all these people that we've wanted to work with so much, but it's sometimes hard to get them around, you know, uh, could kind of all collaborate on the design of this thing and make something happen when when uh, when it was really difficult to. And yeah, I mean the experience, it's a long, it's a bit of a long story, but the experience of being on stage we've been reflecting on over the last month or so and realizing our dependency, first of all, on performing, you know, you were saying the other day and it really struck me is that like, you just don't recognize when you're playing 100, 150 shows a year, you don't recognize how addicted and how dependent you are on, on that interaction, um, not only audience wise, but just the endorphins of playing, you know, um, and I expected to step out on stage and have it feel totally foreign, but it felt great and didn't feel foreign, but I don't know. Yeah. We've also, we're kind of in a, in a moment of processing as well. Like we put out this album and then completely had to change the way one promotes an album or a band promotes an album. Cause usually we just end up hitting the road for months and months and months until we're entirely burnt out and we don't know our face from our hand and stuff. But this was, uh, yeah, this was an entirely uh, new, new plenty of Zoom um, album release time, and uh, and and I think yeah, we're we're still kind of in the in the in just processing mode of of how much 
life has changed and how to proceed moving forward. I think uh, to speak to what Peter was talking about, just in terms of like, you know, our band really relies on human connection and our band really relies on being in a room with people. And that has to do with the way that um, we have this amazing community of fans who feel more like friends, who all really take care of each other and who travel all over the world and who sleep on each other's couches. And part of the most amazing, what something that's so amazing just for us being in our project is that we get to connect with these people and we get to know these people and, and they're amazing and they come out to multiple shows every year and stuff. And some of them have been to like 90 shows and not having that connection of like talking to those people after shows because we often end up at the, you know, we like go meet outside the venue or like at the merch table or whatever and we we just stay and we talk to people for like an hour or two after the show sometimes and I think that's something that I'm really missing is just the the actual feedback that you don't get from like watching likes on your recently released video or you know a album review or <laughs> or any of those things you just you really don't know how how the thing that you made that was so much a part of your own healing and processing um, is affecting people or whether it's affecting people. Which made me think about what Randell was saying in some ways, because, you know, seeing the rise of events, like obviously with, especially when it's a young person coming and performing for one of their first times, do you think that they're able to access a certain level of the same I don't know if it would be called gratification or whatever it is that like opens them up and allows them to perform more and whatnot. How do you find when you're recording things digitally or doing an Instagram live, do they feel excited about themselves afterwards when there's someone new, like an emerging kind of artist? Do you find still? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. I mean, I do think, I do think from the standpoint, it's always exciting to see someone new. Um, but what I think, what, what we've really challenged our artists to do is when you're performing basically to a, a screen or like you have a phone in front of you, is how do you like pretend that that's like your favorite person in the world and you want to sit them down in a chair and you're giving them that intimate concert, uh, concert experience, you know, because we've just recognized that, you know, honestly watching Instagram live after a while just gets boring, you know, no matter how great this person is, it just gets boring because you're staring at a screen. But we've just challenged them to... Uh, take their performance psychology to like the next level. So you're really missing out on that intimacy. Uh, and we also, we also challenge them like, like keep your eyes on the screen, like, you know, not on the screen, but like in the camera so that it feels like you're having an eye to eye experience with somebody, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It's hard. I was just like contemplating, Leo, while well, you were explaining all those people. And I was like, oh, should I, is that a job? Like, could I get rid of my artistic direction job and then like just travel around <laughs> on the road? Like, I was like, that sounds fantastic. And also to Randall's point, it's like, it's so difficult even for new generations of people and how they en engage with the screen, right? So, you know, I'm of a certain generation where I have this kind of hybrid affinity. You know, there's parts of me that like some of those virtual aspects and then there's parts of me that I, I very much get exhausted. And I think that it's it's going to be really hard how we continue to kind of plan for these sort of events. And maybe Heather, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the the world's first ever Inuit Art Center and the opening of that and how that has shifted for the inaugural exhibition Inua. And I think there there's some good good content there. <laughs> yeah, Unasaka. Good evening, everybody. I'm. Uh, Heather, like Julie said, and I'm uh, Inuk from Nunatsiavut, and I'm currently in Winnipeg in an Airbnb because I'm here to uh, open a brand new building, a new museum, and uh, and also an exhibition at the same time that's going to fill the whole museum. It's opening early in 2021, and we were in a meeting last week, and the, the <laughs> event coordinator said, well, the good news is it's one of the only things opening in 2021, <laughs> so you'll have a lot of the attention for that. Uh, but you know, it, it, it was a bit of a, I mean, we, my husband and I and our dogs came here because, uh, from Montreal, because I couldn't imagine not being here in person to install the building. So we came, we quarantined, and now we're here for a couple of months. I'm, I'm thankfully on sabbatical. And uh, we just had a planning meeting for the opening today. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think um, about what are the positives of this situation. And for circumpolar peoples, you know, 
it, the highest expense for performance is the cost of traveling people to and from the Arctic. And we have artists from Greenland and Alaska and all over Inuit Nunanga, Inuit homelands. And so we're thinking like, you know, there is a bit of a silver lining in the sense that we can now uh, pay performers really well from all over the circumpolar world. Whereas, you know, to get Art Cirque, the, um, the Inuit circus troupe that's based in a glue, like to get them down, it would cost, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to bring down a troupe of five or six people potentially. Whereas uh, now we can spread that budget out, we can pay people well, we can have artists uh, tune in or send pre-recorded um, pre -recorded songs and live performance, um, or I guess that's not live performance, but have that sent in so that the opening can be spectacular in other ways. And you know, we're talking about um, the Arctic doesn't have great internet, so we're hoping to partner with the television station so that we can stream it on uh, TV instead of just online. So that's something we have to think about. Uh, as we're planning, but, you know, maybe we can do drone photography inside the exhibition. The ceilings are like 40 feet high, so that's <laughs> it's a possibility, you know, and, and just thinking through what the potentials are for uh, working through this instead of always thinking in terms of limitations. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk a little bit more about the actual, the building in relationship to some of the other work that you're doing around the um, mentoring and uh, working with uh, Inuit folks into the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when when COVID began, I uh, I direct a project called the Inuit Futures and Arts Leadership Project. It's a seven year project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Julie's on the team. Uh, the Winnipeg Art Gallery is one of our major partners, but we have partners all over the north and south. And um, the project is meant to train and mentor Inuit into professional positions in the arts because we have so, so many artists and yet the people who are, you know, if you got an Inuit director, but they can't work with an Inuit sound designer. So they're telling, they're having to tell people, no, snow sounds crunchy in the Arctic. It doesn't smell, sound like snow in Montreal. <laughs> you know, like we need different Foley to do this kind of work. Or you're working with people who don't know what the light is like in the North or, uh, you know, you're a musician and you're, and you're having to sort of give everyone all of that information all the time. Museums are the same way. There's only uh, one in a curator in a permanent position right now in institutions. And so the project is really about training and mentoring people into uh, professional positions so that they can, so we have a little bit more um, balance in, in sort of who gets to, to have a say in how our art is shared. And um, so when COVID hit, we clearly we had to cancel all of our conference plans and meetings and everything else, like everyone in the world. And so we started a, we did a three month um, program, which you can find on our website, inutfutures.ca. We did three months of online artist workshops. And a lot of those were performance based as well. So we had to figure out how to get, uh, you know, throat singers, which is normally two people breathing into each other's mouths. <laughs> you know, so something that we can't do in person anymore. Um, but to get people to uh, learn how to do those kind of performance practices, mostly if some of them are, some of the workshops were just for Inuit, some were for indigenous people, some were for everybody. Uh, the ones that are for everybody are still on our website now. But, um, you know, we had this amazing artist who was, uh, who would record herself on her phone because throat singing is a two part performance. It's a kind of a call and response. And so she recorded herself on the phone and then sang the other half of the song to herself so that the people who were participating in the Zoom call could also learn how they could practice the songs that way. And so I think we've been trying to get really innovative with what's happening there. And now we're, um, so we ended on, on National Indigenous Peoples Day because I think, you know, there's only so long you can do a series of workshops before people get real Zoom exhaustion. And so now we're working with all of the students across the country who are involved in the grant. They're all participating in the um, some of the audio guides and other interpretation that's going to happen for the new exhibition Inua, which I'm curating with three emerging Inuit curators. Um, so we've got our four Inuk curatorial team, Inuit and Anubi Alawit curatorial team. We've got about 17 students across the country working on the development of this audio guide, which will also include uh, all different kinds of Inuit music, not just traditional, but also like groups like Sila and Rise who throat sing to uh, EDM and an opera singer and a, you know, like a guitar player, like all kinds of different musicians who will be working with us on that. We have an Inuit 
Uh, maybe the first ever Inuit exhibition designer, Nicole Luke, who's working with us. We have an Inuit graphic designer. So we're just um, trying to do the most circumpolar project that's ever been done <laughs> to uh, sort of live the work that we uh, want to see and, and sort of set the stage for the for the new Inuit Art Center going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be super exciting and it's, it is hard because, you know, we sat there in that meeting, it was like room of 50 people, room of 50 people and room of 50 people and it's <laughs> going to be streamed and, and, and it does shift your excitement and um, energy because we've had some really amazing projects that's happened out of the Winnipeg Art Gallery where you couldn't actually get into the building because people were busting out of the seams. And so there's something really magnetic about that feeling, right? And I don't want to dwell on it because I know that, you know, this is, you know, this is the cards we're being dealt. And so it's just kind of, we're going to work with it. And so maybe I thought, uh, Odaria, if you want to pick it up from here, it's just um, to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the ways that you've shifted with some of your hosting projects and then also, you know, you've just released a, a CD and, uh, and some, and so you're thinking about staging and performing that way. Uh, well, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting listening to everyone uh, just basically talk about, you know, not necessarily, um, what's next but how to treat what's now you know it's it was all so sudden and uh it was it was a weird exciting time to be honest because we were just running away from our depression right we just had to figure out how to stay far far away from that depression um what happened with me at that very moment i was i just finished a tour I had opened the Bedouin Sound Clash tour. We went across the country. Uh, we started in Victoria and ended in Montreal. And the last date was February 24th. And then I was getting ready to host some events at the Junos, which was going to be in Saskatoon on March 16th. And my flight was March 14th. And I started recording my EP on uh, March, I believe it was 5th or 6th. So I barely got one song done. And I got a call from my manager at CBC, CBC and said, are you in Saskatoon? I'm like, no, nah, why? My flight's tomorrow. She's like, don't get on the plane. It's over. What? So as Peter was talking about, about the NBA, let us know that it, this is for real. I literally watched a million plus dollars get spent on the Junos and watched these folks say, should we do the show? And they had to pull the plug 48 hours before the big show, 20,000 people, because this is for real. So I didn't get on the plane, but a lot of uh, my friends and colleagues were stuck in Saskatoon because they couldn't get a flight home. That was the, I believe it was the Friday or the Saturday. They didn't get home until the Tuesday or the Wednesday. But that was when I realized, okay, this is for real. And I'm, I'm sure some folks here would remember that, that, that line, okay, everyone just stay home for two weeks. <laughs> we'll all get back in two weeks. <laughs> I got that call March 16th that we'll be back in two weeks. So I'm like, what, what are we going to do about my radio show? Well, we're just going to run repeats for two weeks. So I was pulling my hair out because I'm sitting at home, getting depressed, listening to me <laughs> on some show that I recorded a month ago. <laughs> and a month ago, I was happy. <laughs> so I was like, hey, this is after dark everybody hope you're enjoying the show blah 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 but i'm like this is not me i remember calling my boss i'm like you got to get me in there or we got to figure something out because 
I sound so ingenuine right now. I sound, I sound like February up in there. This, this is, March is a different world. We got to get this going. So we really, really worked around the clock to figure out how this was going to happen. Uh, we set up, set up at home. Thankfully, because I'm a musician, I really I had a microphone. I had, I had things at home. Uh, we just had to figure out how we were going to get the show to master control. And, and, you know, it took some trial and error and figuring it out. Um, and then there it was, you know, uh, a whole new show. But uh, the tone was completely different now. The tone was to be in the present. And I was getting a lot of messages from listeners across the country, even in, you know, different parts of the world saying, thank you, we need a human voice, we need something, uh, you know, my Uber Eats delivery guy ain't cutting it for me, like I need something. And I realized how important uh, this, this moment was to keep this show, keep this show going. The show must go on was a term that 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 term goes back to the 20s 30s but that that term is for real right now the show must go on in all aspects yeah i know we got a lot of feedback on nui like why didn't you just cancel you know and so i think that i think that's just it it's like we have no hope so if we if we don't have anything to look forward to and the same for you know some of you guys on the call are saying you know we didn't even contemplate canceling it we just shifted how we were going to do it. And the same thing, you know, we have to kind of think how to mobilize and how to realize that you just like can't just hide in a room for weeks. You know, Heather and I were also in Australia and it wasn't the NBA, it was the NHL when I got a text message from my family saying, the NHL is canceled. I was like, oh, it's for real now. That's worth lots of money. I was like, yeah, okay, exactly. we're booking a flight home. We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. So, oh, you know, you just, it's- a quarantine leg. Yeah, yeah. very intense. <laughs> okay. Very intense. Yeah. So, you know, and I think that that's the important thing. And, and I think it'd be a good opportunity for you, Jen, to talk a little bit about art, artworks to you, if I got the new, the new, yeah. uh, the new framing correct. And also a little bit about Nui Blanche and that kind of shift of thinking about, you know, do we cancel this idea around public art because we're now sitting in this different environment? And instead it's like full steam ahead. And is Jen frozen? <laughs> Amazing. She's thinking really hard. <laughs> wait, wait yep, Julie. Absolutely. <laughs> you, yeah, you froze for a second, Jen. <laughs> yeah, I thought so, but I got this. I got <laughs> so it's good. The performative action with that. And I, I like also that everyone's moment of like, what is it with the Junos? The Jun that moment for me too, for sure. NHL, NBA, and then it was also my son's hockey got canceled, which is usually like, you know, they go, they play no matter what. And I was like, okay, this is, it's getting real. But we were all also taking a little breather because of that too. Um, but as you say, Odario too, is supposed to be this like two week pause. And can we all just, there was, this, there was in some ways, like even with all the challenges, there was this beautiful talk about stillness and slowing. And what can we learn from that? We're all always going so fast. And so I was really, you know, trying to take that in thinking also, we only have two weeks <laughs> to <laughs> also even take that in. Um, but through, um, I've worked on Nuit Blanche uh, for about 15 years since its inception. Um, and, you know, and we were really definitely talking about what do we do being the largest or one of the largest public art events that basically the foundation of what we do is uh, work in public space and bring a, a million people together. So in very close proximity in a lot of cases. So, um, and Julie being the artist, artistic director for the next two years, which is amazing. Like there's a lot of brainstorming and trying to figure out like, also I feel like um, uh, as someone who works at the city and in government, but with a focus on culture and arts, there's a lot of responsibility and accountability with that money, with that time, with the million people who may be tuning in and what is our responsibility and accountability to the public and to uh, the citizens of Toronto to do that. So there was really interesting um, 
conversations around that and to not cancel. And same, I, I think there was never talk of just like, we should stop. It's more, you know, I don't think pivot was being thrown around as much in the first two <laughs> weeks, but now it's just killed it for every dancer. No, yeah. it's like, I don't want to. Yeah. No one wants to pivot turn ever again, basically. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but it was just a chance to rethink um, and reimagine and what does that transformation look like in this potential scenario. But it was so hard to do too because information was changing every day, right? So what are we in now, you know? Um, like you said, Adario, what is the now? Because where, where February was was really different than March and where we're in now, we're in, you know, as we're approaching this like phase two, um, where are we now as compared to where we were in March? But um, so I'm super excited about Nuit Blanche and even that Nuit Talks is happening. And it's a moment to do things for Nuit Blanche that's happening like a book or talk series and dig in deeper. And this is something that I found that's happening in some cases is rather than go bigger, there's a lot of small intimate things happening because in some cases because they, it, it has to be that. But also I really like thinking that that's not um, any lesser value. And that's actually a more of, of really special value right now is those intimate and small connections. You know, like when I signed on to watch Rise a few weeks ago, the, you know, Elle who was hosting was like, hi, Jen, you know, and I was like, oh gosh, Elle sees me, you know, but, um, <laughs> and to have those one-on-one -on -one moments with those performers or I would also say my husband and I drove, you know, a mere 13 hours to see the July talk show because we were in Quebec at the time, but that was worth it for sure. And so these moments, like even the shows become big moments. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I can also say I'm on a project right now called Artworks TO, Artworks with an X, chore choreography. It's like X-Men, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I want to be Wolverine. Yeah. I know I'll do it. So everyone yeah. remembers. Art works. Art works. <laughs> Come on, Randall. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So like performance in time and space, real like, you know, we're doing it right now. Um, so this is part of Toronto's year of public art. And um, and I really like that it's its mandate, which is having to absolutely like everyone shift and um, adjust and transform in this time, but its mandate is also to look at public art itself and public space and who um, has access to making art in time and space and with and who gets funds to do that and what old art needs to be questioned and come down and what new art needs to be elevated and amplified. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. Also, that temporary public art, you know, even this idea of what public art is, it's not just bronzes and monuments and sculptures, all of which, you know, are super uh, important where, the, where that money and focus goes to, but also that temp the conversation around temporary public art, which Nuit Blanche has been as well, um, is playing a real role into that dialogue. Um, and I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I could also say even the city of, within the city of Toronto in the first few weeks when um, COVID hit, there was um, something started called um, the Toronto Office of Recovery and Rebuild. And a lot of the city employees were redeployed. And a lot of my colleagues uh, went to shelters, went to 311. Um, I was supposed to go to shelters, but then I think they realized I have two children at home and that working outside of the house for 13 hours a day might not have been the best candidate. So. I was um, grateful for that, but ready, you know, and we were all, a lot of people really did a, a huge shift and um, the uh, role of sort of like the civil servant really kicked in in this way that was really moving. Um, and then I guess just to say about that, oh, so through that, also this campaign, Show Love to You, has now come out, City of Toronto campaign, really trying to get people where it's possible and where it's safe, out into their communities um to um do things like there's a um a one program that i've been on called stroll to yo and i think we saw uh i think we saw some people walking a lot of people walking in their neighborhoods and um so these strolls were created for people to um hit these different place marks and walk through their neighborhoods and we were performing doing um 
curating programming and performances for people to see as they did this. However, and can you, can you hear me okay? I know there's a bit of feedback. Yeah, okay. So we've had, this was the pivot, and now we've had to pivot within the pivot because of course there's new restrictions that were just announced. So we were really excited getting like also dance artists out there. And you know, we were dance artists were sort of joking sometimes along the way about it was a real footloose moment that it was like, no dancing, do not get close and breathe heavily around each other. But then it was like, no, we can, uh, we can get out there and dance. But now we're having to shift that a little bit and we are trying to figure out right now in the next few days of how our activations will happen for Stroll TO. And I'll just say, I guess one more thing that I, uh, what that came out of this moment for me as a dance artist, and I've worked, I've created choreographic works in public space for about 20 years on and off. But um, uh, my colleagues and I, Sarah Doucette and Kate and Kervis created um, an activation and a dance platform that we're calling Door to Door Dances. And we are delivering dances door to door. And right now we've been focusing these dances on long-term care homes and retirement residents. And the first one we did was to my parents so we could give it a tryout. And I phoned my dad and I said, if I show up and dance in front of your building and will you be embarrassed or is this okay? <laughs> and he said, it's okay. So that was good. You don't know. I wasn't hundred percent sure. And then so we also it. worked with the programming department at the residence. What's that? That you pick the harshest ones for feedback. It's like go straight to the parents. Totally. To like, oh, exactly. And like, that's why I say the most cutthroat to be like, Jen, not a good idea. Totally. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> they were they were like, this the first dance was better than the second one. Anyway, so we did a couple dances and really made it for our audience. And it was interesting because we really chose our audience in a way. Like normally the audience buys a ticket and comes to us, but we were like, we're coming to you. <laughs> So we're dancing to like the Isley Brothers, the Beatles, and it's really like joyful, entertaining. And, you know, normally we kind of would like to work with a little bit more edge and darkness and whatnot. But so it was really fun to do that kind of choreography. And um, at the end of it, they yelled, encore. And we were like, we don't have any other dances. <laughs> we only choreographed two. <laughs> so then we're like, we'll do the first one again. <laughs> so... It's a very sweet, light project, but we're taking it really seriously and we hope that we can use it in ways where our love of dance might be able to be used in this and accessed in this moment. I guess I'll leave it there. Yeah, thinking of love of dance, Leah, you, you are a performer by nature, if, I'm, if I am correct. And, uh, and I know one of the questions that just came at us was, uh, you know, asking about if you guys are going to do more drive-ins or if like that's the one. And then maybe you guys want to talk about um, some of your future plans of what you're excited about doing, not just in the now, but also in the future and what we're kind of, what, what you are the most excited about. Yeah, I think that the, the problem with the drive-in shows is just that they're really expensive to put on. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a so, financially good uh, idea. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was a really, yeah, I, I feel we're really grateful for that experience. Obviously, it's probably the only show that we'll be able to do in 2020 and until who knows when. Um, but yeah, but I think that this is a time of, uh, there's a lot of time to consider priorities and what have been our priorities for so many years and why. And, um, and Jen, I like what you said about, you know, performance opportunities becoming smaller. And I think that there's kind of an opportunity for that in many ways, um, even in, in just a community level. I mean, something that's changed for us about promoting this album from home in Toronto and not on the road is that we, you know, are much more at one and much more aware of what's going on in the city of Toronto and how um, COVID has uh, affected this particular place right now. And, you know, what are the, the what are people doing here to try and, and uh, ease harsh, harsh conditions? And I mean, in Toronto, like there happens to be a, there's something called ESN, the Encampment Support Network 
that happens to be kind of um, put together by some of the really talented musicians and artists in Toronto. And I, I think that's kind of like an interesting common thread is that in times where, you know, it's like there are a group of people who are basically providing support, things like um, collecting donations and buying tents and food and water bottles and sleeping bags and fire extinguishers for people who are living without housing right now. Um, and it's like kind of an interesting thing for people who make their, uh, who glean all their joy and, you know, make their money from, from making music and then going out on tour, uh, when you can't tour and you're, and you're staying at home. Um, the link, I guess, between just, okay, well, what is the most, what's the priority right now and what's in dire need of happening uh, right now um, and, and how that intersects with an art practice and, and whether it does or not. Um, there's a lot of big questions, I think, being asked by everyone on a global level <laughs> as well as on a, on a more local level of just like, uh, how do I choose life? <laughs> how do I not give up? What's the thread of hope that, uh, that I can hold on to? And I think for, for most people who rely on art and who rely on expression for their purpose in life, it's like, it's really important to care about other human beings. Um, and there are so many ways in which, uh, there's a lot of time to reflect on that. <laughs> and what Jen was saying too, is that early on in COVID, like that we all were thinking about that, right? That was all the conversations that were happening early on was like, how can we take this time of pause? Like, you know, if you would have asked us at the end of 2019, whether the world needed a time out, like we would have all said yes, right? Like, you know, we're all in a pretty dire situation. And I think that like, you know, obviously I don't think it's a, coincidence necessarily that like this massive you know racial power dynamic recalibration whatever you want to kind of call what's happening globally like um i hope that there's a chance to like come out of this experience you know with a legacy to leave right like and and i think that as much as we you know, we personally, like from a personal level, I think as an artist or as anyone that's public facing, like it's it's been a hard time to negotiate what that kind of social contract looks like. Um, and, and Odario, you said something which really cued me to think about, you know, this sort of anachronism of like having your show play that was reruns over a time that doesn't work that way. You know, like even watching you know, we were watching Beyonce's homecoming show a while back and like, it's so interesting watching things from before COVID and seeing how that context plays out um, because it does make me feel about a high school student going to university or going to Europe and coming home and saying, oh, I can't believe I was even, like, I didn't know anything before this. And it kind of, I hope, that this experience of COVID and, and possibly, you know, a decent election result in November, you know, we might be able to come out of this with, with some sort of positive legacy. And, and I hope that it's not all kind of for naught. Um, but I think that, yeah, we've been just constantly chatting about how the hell are we supposed to interact with the world right now? You know, it's just, a, it's a completely different social dynamic that we're sort of signing up to with every, Instagram post or with you know however we choose to and so we feel lucky you know we got through the drive-in shows and now we're kind of trying to take time to reflect that and talk to people we respect and and those that we respect honestly resoundingly have no idea what's going to happen when we talk to them about it and I think that's something that's worth admitting you know but but it's very inspiring to hear the ways to which, chat with you yeah, yeah. um that clearly, you know, humans are so adaptable and that also extends to art practice and in a, in a huge way, obviously, in these ways where you have, you know, entire arts organizations like changing the way that 
that the art gets to the people. So the people need art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I muted Heather. I just, yeah, Heather, Heather I, had this good quote. Well, like, like, think about what happened with the Sobies and how they gave the award to everybody instead of to one person. And then there was a, I don't know if you saw that because it's in the visual arts, but then there was a huge letter from basically every artist who's ever got it and every other artist I've ever heard of in Canada, all saying, please go to this format. We don't want one big prize. We want lots of people supported, you know? When we did our, our COVID related workshop series, you know, it was the, I was in the workshops because I was leading them, but like just making a pair of earrings or like listening to someone talk for an hour and doing something that got yourself out of your head like that was the mental health space that I needed and that that was all the feedback that we got was that people were like it's great to learn new skills but I also I need this creative practice because it's where I'm drawing all of my well-being from you know and so um, I, I hope that as we edge towards another lockdown people are now like stocking up on beads or buying an instrument or like you know doing something that is also gonna get us through the, the next wave of what seems like it's inevitably coming because, you know, I just, I hope there's a bunch of kids in their bedrooms just like getting really good at something right now because like you were saying, um, Peter, you know, it's like we, we might have this, you know, we don't know what it's like for, for young people now and, and like missing that opportunity of performing, but maybe there will be this creative boom that comes out of the end of this, you know. I mean, TikTok seems to be thriving. <laughs> but Trump shut it down. <laughs> shut it down, apparently. I think people have TikTok in Canada. In some ways, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's true. A lot of lessons have gone online, dance classes, like, and that, that's it. And even in terms of like performing in public space and the internet being that public space and that access to that public, it has its pros mm -hmm. and its cons. And for sure, at the yep. same days, I feel so screened and zoomed out. You know, and at the same time, you know, I like to, you know, dance with Ryan Heffington and whatnot when I can or put on, you know, <laughs> see whether or tune into Rise or whatever those moments are. They're, con they're connected. They're connective. And I think that's yeah. part of also this conversation around the value of the arts, too. Like you say, Heather, is like recognizing uh, the, the connection to mental health and, and well-being. And, and it's so layered. And we all know this, you know, we're preaching to the converted. But... Um, and Amanda Paris wrote a great article about maybe we never not value the arts again because everyone is at no. home and this exactly. is our connection yeah. and our access. So, but I do worry about the unsustainability and that effect on mental health for, of course, a lot of artists and people of, you know, of all different kind of uh, employment and economics um, in, you know, in a long-term effect of COVID. I mean, the flip though is that I, I've, I've Heard, I've attended more um, talks with black scholars and black artists and black activists than I would ever have had access to in, you know, it, that I would have seen in a year or two years in another context. You know, so it's like, it is, there is an opportunity that democratizes some of the spaces and give, is giving people platforms that, you know, before when you had to travel to be somewhere and, and how we see how much that disenfranchises people and how much we can learn when we have, you know, the internet. Hundred percent. I did. I went to a. I felt I was. Uh, I listened to a book launch at one point while I went for a walk, and I was like, "Well, that's kind of nice <laughs> to do that." <laughs> there was um. There's like a some people that I, I got connected to, and some of the things they were doing is they'd have like one DJ. He got really creative, and he would actually have a sound system like in his driveway, and just have people on the street kind of dancing. Um, and I had, you know, so I think there's like different ways that we've had to learn to pivot. Like we're very adaptive as human beings, but uh, you know, the challenge is as this, as winter comes in, it's going to make things even more challenging because being outside isn't going to necessarily be the same, but I'd love to see like VR opportunities um, happen. Um, like more VR opportunities. You know, I think uh, the NBA did something really, really amazing. Um, so it was last year when J. Cole was their feature. Uh, basically, they had seats with like cameras and you could tune in. It's kind of what the NBA is doing right now. You can kind of tune in by wearing a VR, uh, a VR headset and you could be there while like a performance is happening. And I think that's kind of be the way of, <laughs> of a lot of like concerts or moving forward. Because at least you still get that interactive feel to it, right? It's not just you staring at a screen. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think some of the stuff that we're moving for Nui is that you don't even have to have the VR headgear. So we're just making ah. sure you have the mobile. <laughs> so most people have a mobile. Oh, that's phone, amazing. Right? So the idea yeah. is, that, you know, you can plunk art into any space that you want to. You can throw it on your kitchen table. You can put it in mm. the car. If you're on a building, and you're like, oh, this building needs to be, <laughs> you know, and you can change that context, I think. And I think that just that potential of what AR, VR, and um, MR have to give us is actually mm -hmm. kind of exciting, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's coming at such a forced rate, right? Oh, Jerry, totally. have you want to add anything before we uh, Yeah, I'll tell you this, listening to the that VR and, and virtual stuff, I've... I'm a performer. I've performed in front of thousands of people for years and years and years and years. I've never, ever been nervous ever doing that. The only time really? I've ever gotten nervous is about to perform in front of a camera. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm freaking out. I was even nervous doing this thing. Because <laughs> I didn't want to free... <laughs> that was good. That was good. It's that was a whole good. it's a whole other level of performance. A whole mm -hmm. other level. Mm -hmm. Um I would have loved to hang out. I was supposed to to join um uh July talk and just take a peek in on, on this drive in thing. I, I think that would have made me really nervous. It was yeah. actually kind of nice. Like in the, the camera people are some of our best friends that we've worked with for like 10, 15 years, you know, a lot of them went to film school with us and all these things. So it was a blessing that all the camera people were in that front pit area because the cars were like 50, 40 feet away or something to start. And they were all sort of facing the screens, but we kind of just got to play a show to our friends. Yeah. Was, mm -hmm. and tonight, but if they hadn't been there, right at least for me, it was very helpful to have that. Leia was climbing out and going with the cars. But I was, I was gonna say, I thought that was so great, the, the use of the car as basically the, in this object of public space. Like when you're like, everyone put on your headlights, everyone honk your horns. Like I stood on my car and was like, yeah! Like it was just it, nothing. It was very magical. I wore a mask when I left the stage, just so everyone knows. <laughs> public, <laughs> public following protocol. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a hell of an experience. I mean, I think the the thought of being able to do it sustainably would be so great. I know people have tried to do that and, and created venues and stuff like that. It's just a matter of like, in the best case scenario, it's like someone's watching a live concert film being captured. And I think that's really what you're or at least what we were after what randell is getting at with like a full experience situation is a whole other realm um and i'm curious you know like how that intersects with like do are you able to interact with other people that are watching it somehow and and i and you know that's when i start you know feeling a little out of my own element but i'm i'm super curious about it and i would love to try it out you know i think it'd be so for cool. sure it's necessary though we're just i think we're just missing out that intimacy and that engagement you know and and uh it'd be nice to see and that's just the thing about technology it's really meant to connect us right but uh in the same way it disconnects us in the ways in which we're able to be to share to have intimate moments with one another you know um and i'd love to see technology kind of advance in that way and i and i'm sure we're going to see that in the next couple of years uh, you know, there's a lot of prototyping that's happening right now as a result of COVID and how technology can better interact with human beings, right? So uh, it's a process. Uh, I think we're getting there, but we'd, we'd, we'd just like to see more of it. Because even when things get back, um, when things get back into it, I'm sure at the end of the day, more concerts are still going to be live streamed just because now you realize there's a wider audience, you know, like even with Rise, we've been doing it and people from the UK, people from Ghana tune in. So um, I think that's going to be something that's really going to, you know, become, I guess, uh, more, more of a must, you know? Mm -hmm. You're so yeah. right, Randall. Like it was already happening, but now it's going to just accelerate at a pace that uh, is, could be really exciting. Slash totally. Terrible. <laughs> oh, very terrifying. <laughs>
I I'm very interested in the this idea that multiple people have talked about is this kind of concept of like Leo was mentioning too. This like it's a lot easier to focus on your own community and like trying to wrap your head around what's happening locally because of COVID is one thing, right? And then your interaction with technology forces you to to relate to it on this massive level where you have to take in every perspective around the world. And it seems like often it doesn't feel like a spectrum. It feels like an either or. It feels like you're either going to like look at your own, you know, backyard and you're going to see in Toronto that like, you know, vulnerable folks are not being supported. Um, and or you're going to look at the entire world and there's no way, you know, when we used to tour and stuff, it was a little easier to get a feel for different communities and understand how we all kind of can be more similar. But that seems to be a main struggle that like is created by this kind of current situation, which is quite interesting. And I think it's one of the most positive parts. It's like I think about Nui and I think about how Toronto is the epicenter and then people travel to Toronto to experience it in the physical sense. But I'd say one of the most positive to kind of lean on what Jen had said at the beginning of her speaking, you know, that we actually have this ephemeral aspect that we've never had before for Nui. So we actually are gonna be able to re reach a broader audience. We're gonna have people on the other side of the planet that are gonna be able to engage with this material in a different way. And I think for me, cause you know, I'm only around till uh, 2021, we actually have that opportunity to have that base as, as that material. And we we get really good at the kind of virtual component. And then with the hopes that we're gonna be able to still gather in physical space for 2021 and we can augment uh, you know, that, that experience on both ways. And then we can open that platform up to a larger international audience, which I think is gonna be really exciting. And I think that that's kind of where I see the possibility of the future going for, for performing and public installations and art. So I wanna say T. McGwitch and Marcy to all you guys, I, I can't uh, thank you enough for bringing your good minds and good hearts and lovely spirits to the to the virtual boxed realm as we as we sit here and uh, smile at each other's faces. I of course want to um, <laughs> by saying thank you to our continued support at the University of and the Doris um, MacArthur Gallery and also the support of the province of Ontario, the Celebrate program grant and uh, join us on Thursday. We have a really great group of speakers at um, 8 p.m. this Thursday. And uh, thanks so much for everybody joining us. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Julie. Thanks.